One. Welcome back to the Lunchtime Catch-Up. My name's Grant. This is episode eight. Uh, with me is Scott. Hello, everyone. On, the, on this week's episode, we're going to do a quick re- review of the GC game, the Gold Coast game, V-Bombers. Um, we're going to do a, uh, a quick review um, with the upcoming game against Frio. But I guess this episode, episode eight, is going to be... Uh, it's one of our favourites. Um, this episode, we've got a, uh, an Essendon great on the line with us, um, and that is Smokin' Joe Mercedes. G'day, Joe. Hi oh, boys, how are we tonight? Yeah, yeah doing we're well, really Jerry. good, really good. Great, great to have you on. Yeah, pleasure to be on, boys. Uh, yeah, we can't tell you how excited we are. Um, I still remember sort of me being in my, I would have been in my twenties now, watching the old '93 Grand Final oh, when you're yeah, eighteen, yeah. and you and me both. I was sat right next to you. So um, we we're just uh, talking before, just even offline, uh, about our memories of sort of Wendy Hill, um, and we both have a little bit of a similar story about. Um, Sitting on a stool behind the cheer squad and on the on the sort of on the wing there is that? Can you just tell us about your memories at Essendon? Oh, I mean, very similar, mate. From probably the age of five and six, we we with dad and uncle uh, migrated from Italy, mate. They 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 grew up in Nicholson Street, which is the street behind Windy Hill. They found they heard a big roar one day and they snuck into Windy Hill in the whatever years it was, many moons ago, and they were hooked on footy ever since. And then when I was old enough to go at about five or six years of age, they put me on a stool behind the uh, cheer squad, whacked me down there for the whole game while they snuck up and uh, you know, had four or five cans watching the footy. <laughs> Very nice. And th- thankfully, they, they remembered to uh, collect me after the game and take me home. So, yeah, it was, it was some great memories of, of Wendy Hill. Thank goodness they did that, yeah. Do you remember, like, there's, there's some iconic kind of things about Wendy Hill, and I'll just see if you have the same memory as me. I always, there's key things that I used to remember. One was... Um, like the peanut guy that used to go around. Well, he's the uh, only man I remember the footy, the peanut man. Yeah, there was always the there was like key things. It was the the 34, 34 centimeter color TV. I, I love that because used to come around with it. It was a sometimes it was a chalkboard that they'd written yeah. the number on. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't right. it the same when they had the, the, the two bikes or they? They walked around with a blanket. You had to throw some coins. Yeah, in the what? Blanket. A, that was the actual cheer squad, wasn't it? Raising money for the cheer squad. Oh, I think the yeah. cheer squad used to walk around wow, that's and used to I... and used to throw money on the blanket. Wow. And, uh... Yeah, I remember blokes used to piff twenty cent pieces and trying to hit him in the head. That would hurt, wouldn't it? <laughs> From a distance with some decent velocity attached. <laughs> it was just one of those grounds that just had some, some sort of precious memories. And when you look back, I, I remember like even days where I think we played Sydney once and it was like the hot dog stand got on fire or something on the wing. Oh, there was like these just weird sort of days the famous wind socks kind of getting tied up by sheets. Um, it just had sort of that tribal kind of... Field. It's the suburban ground. That's it. That's the cool part about those old the suburban grounds is that it's it's a little bit feral. So you can get your, <laughs> you get a few of the ferals out there. You get like the 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 crowds are nice and close. From a from a player's point of view, Joe, do you do you feel like like playing at the G? Obviously, eighty thousand, ninety thousand people at the G. The the atmosphere is incredible. But do you feel the presence of the the supporters more on those smaller grounds? Oh, well, I only played maybe a couple of two games at Windy Hill because I played the boot the year we went to we moved to the G. Uh, yeah. But out on the ground, I really played senior foot out. Was similar was probably the Western Oval. Um, I think I might have played a couple of games at the Junction. But yeah, most of my footy was played at well, the MCG. Uh, Eddie had and, and all the I could do your park when it wasn't you know so yeah yeah you know, that wasn't renovated as much and couldn't see as many people. That was like an old suburb ground. But yeah, they were great. But they just felt that the crowd was on top of you all the time, and it's, the home games were okay. But when I said, "Well, you play at Kedinia Park or Western Oval," yeah, it was uh, it was, could, be, could be quite traumatic sometimes. Especially <laughs> you walk off the ground and you'd have a good win, and you know you get trying to get people punching you and spitting on you. And, Seriously, people yeah, throwing yeah, a punch. Adelaide, Adelaide was the worst. That was the worst. That's why I don't know if you realise, but many moons ago there used to be like a snowball race walking down, but now they've had to put all that perspex around. That's right, that's right. Right. Yeah. Oh and that was because the feral Adelaide supporters they used to try and do anything, throw drinks at you, try and lunge at you if you if you beat the crows over there or you beat beat the power. So Damn. it could get uh, it could get a little bit scary there, mate. So that's why they had to put up some more uh, security measures around, well, the, around the race. Well, that was sort of answered my next question was is which who were the, the most feral fans. Oh, crows by a hundred thousand miles, mate. Really, not even like the pies or anything. No, they're, they're been okay. Every time I played the pies, we didn't really play that small suburban ground, so we. Oh yeah, we, yeah. we played the pies at the G every time, so the the crowd really couldn't get near. But uh, yeah, that uh, that would have been a bit scary playing at Victoria Park, though. I wow. Just <laughs> I remember. I remember going to Footy Park 
uh, like decade or so ago. And I didn't realize it, until, not until you go there, do you realize that how how full on it is. And we lost by one point that game. And I, and, uh, I just remember walking through the car park, he's me with my Essendon gear on, and just like, went, just like, you seriously think you're going to die? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, over there, the, the uh, Crows and Power fans are very feral, mate. But they probably say that about us. Uh, exactly. Base teams as well. So. Yes, it's true. It's good to this say there's true. a bit of rivalry. There's a bit of a, uh, you know, there's a bit of uh, you know, banter to and from the um, opposition and supporters. I think it's pretty, pretty healthy for footy. And and does it? I mean, I they say that the Adelaide's like this cauldron there now, and it's 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 really tough to play. I mean, does from again from a player's point of view, playing in the state is always different to playing at home, and it's a different preparation, and it's it's harder to do, but. Is it really a factor? Like, is it is it something that you've you've got to lift, get that ten percent more into your game? Because you just know that the Adelaide guys are just going to be feral supporting them, and you're basically not going to get much support over there yourself. Yeah, it probably shouldn't be, but mentally in the back of your, back of your mind, it, it probably is. Where you know, it's always initially that, that everyone, especially the early days when we had we started getting all the state clubs into the competition, where you had to travel, as you said before, you were. Out of your comfort zone, you have to have different preparations, you're going to catch a plane, sleep in a hotel, different pillow, different bed, all sorts of stuff like that that's uh, we'll be in silky lalas about. But it should really affect you. I think it did mentally, but I can see nowadays, especially the last 10 or 15 years, that the, the clubs accommodate a lot better for, for sides, I think that's their own term, and players uh, you know, really switch on to, to play in these different uh, different venues around Australia, mate, because let's be honest, it's a, it's a truly national game now, and you actually yeah. have to travel every Absolutely. three or four weeks, even if you're so let's go back to when you're coming through uh, Keel or Park days. Is it? Would I be right and say was it someone like a Noel Jenkins that would have spotted you at, at an early yeah. age? Yeah, so not an early age, but um, back, that was back in the days where I was the last uh, of the last of the Mohegans, mate, to get in the <laughs> under 19s and the, the last bit where it was all um, you know you had your own zones. And I grew up in East Keel. I played at Keel Park, but East Keel was an Essendon zone, mate. So. I got noticed by Jado and played under 15 footies in the oh, northwest side, which is which is affiliated with Essendon. And you're yeah, lucky enough then to go on and play a couple of years at Teal Cup under under Dennis Pagan. Uh, and then from there, I um, yeah, played 19s from I think I played my first year at, at uh, 15 and played a couple of years there. And my second my second year when I was just about to turn 17 or 16 turning 17 was the year they decided to get rid of the 19s, so they had to form a a, a senior list. And uh, yeah, so I was lucky enough to. I think John O'Keefe told me I was probably the last pick on that senior list. Uh, it started in 92 because I wasn't the best trainer. I was a little bit lazy and uh, I was never that dedicated. But uh, <laughs> I, you could see a little bit of talent in me, which, thank God, uh, was the case. And, uh, yeah, and from then on, yeah, sort of, uh, I, I did look back from about 92 onwards. So am I right in saying I'm pretty sure um, if – let's just see if my memory – um, serves me well. Around about 1991, I think you had to even had to convince Sheeds almost um, that you could basically play and you had the ability to play and, and work hard. Yeah, yeah, I know that about it. Well, everyone had to sort of convince the, the, the coach. But uh, yeah, it was 91. That was, that was my last year, the 19. I was only 16. Uh, and as, as I was a bit lazy, and he just sort of came to me and said, Well, listen, we, we're going to go with you. There's a couple of people going in the back for you. Uh, Dennis Payne was going to take over the twos role and he really liked me because you could see I had a little bit of talent. Jado went in the back for me as well, but she said, it's up to you. We're going to give you 12 months and, and uh, sort of see what happens. And uh, yeah, I played a year in the twos in 92. And I went to BNF and got to debut as a 17-year-old. Uh, played a couple of games at the end of 92 and then ended up playing a, in a reserve flag with uh, you know, a couple of my heroes and then in, uh, in Terry Danaher. And I saw Matt wasn't playing, I was injured, but he yeah, got to play in a flag with with TD when I was a seven year old, which was wow. uh, yeah, a special moment in my career. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and considering what we talked about at the start of the podcast, when you, when you, when you're sort of earlier watching guys like Terry Danaher at a, at, as a kid, and then suddenly you're playing, just even even for a short time, that would be an amazing sort of just amazing respect I guess you would have against someone like that, such a big name at the club. Yeah, that no, was sensational. I still remember my second game. My first game was uh, versus North Melbourne at the G and. My second game was out of Waverley, I don't know if you remember, when we played Geelong, and that was the, the game they farewelled uh, Timmy Watson, Sob Madden, and Terry Danaher. Yeah, so that's I, right. I, I got to play in that game out of Waverley, and uh, yeah, so some, some uh, really, really great memories in my first couple of games and my first year at, uh, at, at Essendon. So you're getting to 1993 then, and um, at the start of the year, did you, was there ever a feeling that what obviously eventuated could actually happen, or was it really just 
um, in all boring terms, taking it game at a time, then suddenly it just build and build and build. Now nah, it, it was a bit of a runaway train, mate. We we thought nothing. I'm pretty sure we made the grand final of the preseason cup back then. It was the Foster's Cup. I think we may have even won it uh, yep. in, the, in the summer of '93. And there was never any expectations. We were just a group of kids that, let's be honest, we were lucky. We were playing AFL footy. We were getting in the in, in the turf every you know, Friday, Saturday night. <laughs> it was just a, it was a great it was a great time of your life. Uh, and then, yeah, as I said, mate, we didn't we didn't have our first win on the board in '93. I think it was around six or seven. We had four or five losses, a draw, and then I'm pretty sure our first four point game came in maybe three or six or seven. So it's definitely nothing really was expected, or anything was on the cards. But uh, yeah, it just just progressed, and then you know, Sheeds and David Weed, and it was Danny Corcoran there, and we had a great mix of senior players too. And they just said, "Let's." The motto that year was speed kills, you know, which, which really didn't apply to me, but everyone, everyone else, but <laughs> they just said, Get, let's just play on at all costs. We've got nothing to lose. No one expects us to do anything. And it sort of clicked. And, yeah, we just moved the ball that fast. And people, other clubs didn't realise what we were doing. So I didn't realise, but they couldn't plan for us because they didn't really expect it. And, um, as I said, the, the combination of, you know, all the old farts and then the young kids, they gave them a bit of impetus and a bit of excitement. And, uh, yeah, just she, she clicked and... Yeah, we had a great final series, and yeah, we won a flag. With I think it was about well, it might have been eight or nine kids under the age of twenty-one years of age. So that's right. It was quite unbelievable. So when you <clears throat> excuse me, Joe, when you um when you're sitting around the locker room or you're on the on the turps on a Friday night, was there ever a stage in '93 where you had a chat to the boys or you were just talking amongst yourselves and you thought we we are more than half a chance here? Like when did you think that you you could win it? No, I think it was the oh, it was the old famous game where she's. Waved his jacket. I think it wasn't a final. It might have been a second last game or oh, the last game of the year. Yeah, yep. we beat West Coast, and they were the running premiers. And I remember back there when they, you know, they all pumped the weights, and they were some big men playing, and you know, we were some skinny kids, and we managed to beat them to the G. And I think from there we got a bit of belief, or, or the kids did. I think the older yep. blokes thought, geez, these kids can, you know, withstand pressure and can play. You know, they're not just downhill skiers, and that's when the belief really kicked in, I think. And then obviously our first final, we went down to Geelong round. 23 or 24 back then and we got a lot of injuries and you know, to play Carlton in the in the first I think what they call it back then a qualifying final oh, yeah. only lost by two points I think we had six blokes out that were going to come straight back in I was one of those and uh, I think we're going to be fighting up we lost to Carlton just which was a great effort you know having six outs in the week before and we played uh, we played West Coast again and uh, they were favourites to win the flag that year and yeah, we come out and rolled them in a in a semi, and then we got to the Crows. The infamous, well, not the infamous, the infamous for the Crows, but the famous game for for the Bombers, where we are, well, seven goals down at half time. They come out and get the first goal, which no one remembers. So we only eight goals down at you know, the three minute mark of the third quarter. And, you know, Timmy Watson turned it on down. He turned it on that day, and yeah. we beat them. And when we come home and steamrolled them, mate, no one was ever going to get the nearest in the grand final. Their confidence was sky high, and you know, as you can see, we pretty much put a cup in the water in the first quarter and a half of, of a grand final. Now, I I look at that ninety three year and I look at the at the players such as yourself and Mark McCurry and the like. And now I'd I'd regard you guys as like Rolls Royce. Like you're, you're a, there was classy footballers in that side. They're all talented. You guys are all talented, clearly. But there was like there was class in the in the disposals. There was class in the way you guys um, um, played the football. And I guess I, I look at the teams today and and people that are drafted today. And there's a lot of kids getting drafted just on athletic ability and I look at I wonder whether or not you've got any opinion on whether or not there is a sh- being a shift back now to to drafting really classy footballers people that have got talent and football talent and less about that six foot four midfielders let's hope so mate because that was there's only a bit of part of footy I didn't really enjoy when I, when I finished playing <laughs> and let's be honest I wouldn't, I wouldn't have looked at if I was trying to get drafted nowadays but uh Disappointing, and that's why I think you sort of see so many skill errors in today's footy, where yeah, okay. all the athletes get drafted. They're, they're great when it's plan A, and you know, the witches had to out like a training draw, but as soon as they need a contingency plan, you know, they'd be so D, that's when their skills go all over the shop because they're not natural footballers, and they don't really know what to do under pressure. So I'm hoping that it does go back the way of you know, getting some footballers in there. So you look at the likes of you know, Sam Mitchell, who's going to be. Yeah, of the game. He, he, I reckon I can only beat him in a race. Um, <laughs> even now, but you know, you got play so that's just a smart football. Just IQ. There's still, yeah. yeah, there's plenty of smart. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of room in AFL footy for you know for the smart 
Footballers, you know, just know how to get the footy and just know how to play footy. Uh, he's got that too. I like watching play. He's got that McGovern over at West Coast. He doesn't look like an athlete at all, but geez, he can play, can't he? So yeah. there's uh, there's room left in it. And as you said, I'm, I'm hoping they swing swing back to that way, mate. Now, in the in that 93 grand final, you obviously have that sort of famous goal from the boundary line as the sirens sounding. Even though you're 18, is that actually one of the biggest football moments you had in your career? To tell you the truth, mate, no, because I didn't really know what I was doing. I, I really <laughs> just said, because the game was really wind, it was really smoke. Where Dave Calthorpe reminds me every time I see him that his goal was a lot more important when he sort of stood out of the centre. First time in his whole life, he kicked the ball over 45 <laughs> metres that day but, to keep the goal. So I, I was just really just wanted to, I, I wanted to keep the goal, but I just said, I, I sort of went back and I was pretty close. I was on the fence and kicked it and then didn't go through. So it, it was, looking back now, it was a pretty big moment, but. I didn't realise probably how big until probably you know, five or six years after that grand final was played. Did you get any options inside 50? Was anybody putting their hand up or did you think, well, no, this is going if I did, If I did, that, I didn't look, mate. So, no, I didn't look? was close. Yeah, and I, because I remember half of the third quarter, Carlton were coming back at us a little bit. You know, they kicked, I think, two or three or four in a row. And then, obviously, Dave burst out and kicked that goal. And then I, I knew it was close to, to a siren time. And a couple of the old fellas were saying, just take it easy, take up your time and, uh, you know, have a shot on goal. I think that's why I kicked it, mate. The sort of went and put us, I think, back to seven or eight goals up, and the game was uh, done and dusted, mate. That's a hell of a hoof, though. That, that was a decent kick, too. It was a good one, wasn't it, mate? It was, I think it was about 65 metres out, about row four of the southern oh, stand, mate. 70, 70, 70 at least. It was 70. There were 72 <laughs> metres. I, I measured it. <laughs> we can confirm it. It's longer every year, mate. Yeah. Hey, so um, uh, it's funny that I remember it's like, we Essendon has like sort of players that I reckon I, I get a little bit undersold. Um, and when those '93 teams, I used to, you know, I used to always think Shawnee Denham was a just a gun footballer um, that never probably got his due respect. Um, is it is there players like that? You go, I know, you know, I know the McCurries and a few others had sort of a lot of hype, but was there players in that team that you went, oh, they're just so reliable every week to do their job? Oh, as you said, you probably get the nail on the head there with Shawnee Denham. He just he had a job every week where he'd stop the best off the line, but still get a whole heap of the ball himself. And he was as tough as nails, my old Shawnee. He was a very, very tough player, mate. So we had a lot of blokes. Like Gary O'Donnell was never a flashy man, but he just did his job week in, week out. One of the best and fairest yeah. that, you know, that year and in Premiership year. So we had a lot of players. Like we had a, we had a few, don't, don't get me wrong, we did have a few Rolls Royces and you know, Michael Long, and we haven't had the old oh, Michael Long. Long. Play. Yeah. yeah, Michael Long could play a bit. Yeah, yeah um, Gavin Wanganeen. So Gavin, we had a few yeah. superstars playing, and uh, I just remember too the old the old man Dustin Fletcher. Would, I remember you know, kids playing the same side to this year at the at Everfieldy Footy Club, and I kept I, he keeps reminding me. He goes, he used to he used to play back in the day when the full back you'd have to his first year. I think he had Kernan, Lockett, yeah. Modra, and Dunstall. Had the best full forwards, you know, in in football history. So and he mm-hmm. did a great job too. But yeah, we had we had a few players that we just had a lot of. Even contributors over over the time and over that year, and uh, yeah, that's what sort of held us in good stead. Do you see any um, similarities with the the Bulldogs this year and sort of the ninety three ninety four kind of how that played out? How, how the Bulldogs obviously aren't, aren't pretty much I, I, not going to make the final. You know, I think yeah, you know, I think well, I think we probably shot ourselves in our foot ninety four. We got a bit far ahead of ourselves. You know, we're all young copper hoop thing and we're playing a grand final in our first twenty games. It's going to happen every year, but. I think with the Bulldogs and you know, advancement nowadays with technology and opposition tactics, I think other clubs have just worked them out this year, the Bulldogs. So I don't think it had anything to do with them you know, being ill-disciplined or undisciplined uh, yeah. in their professionalism, but uh, that's probably what definitely got us out in 94, 95. We just uh, believed their own hype and publicity, and we just thought that, uh, that it would happen every year. Yeah, you, you just wonder when, with where young side has success, how they mentally then go on to the next year. Um, and yeah, it's hard, yeah. yeah, it's hard because you're playing, you're playing a tougher sport in the world at the highest level, and you know you're 18, 19, 20. And you're still a kid, and yeah. You don't go to school to, to learn stuff like that. It's just, it's, yeah, you've got to learn the job, and some adapt quicker than others, and others some adapt, adapt quick, some adapt, adapt don't sorry, don't adapt at all. Uh, yeah, so it's very hard. And as I said, if you don't go to school for that sort of stuff, and there's no psychologist in the world that can tell you, you know, how it's going to play out, mate. It's just, it's just, it's just life, mate. It's just one of those. Life's roads, and you've got to see which which fork in the road you're taking. Hopefully, there's not too many speed ups on the way. Yeah. Great. So, um, what would you say would be your best year of footy in your your opinion? I mean, you averaged 25 disposals in the Premiership year of 2000, and again in 90 in uh, 97 and 99. But which is it? it Maybe even not just so much statistics. Which do you think was your best um, year? Oh, I, t- I still think 2000. Uh, 2001. I had a no, 2001, 2000. 
two, I can't remember where, I, I think I come fourth in the BNF and I missed 10 games with a broken wrist. Um, I was leading the BNF by a mile and uh, as yeah, broke, Big Lance fell on me, the big fella, and broke my wrist and I missed 10. But I, I had a few good years, 2000 I think, uh, personally and also as, as a team, we're obviously with the most dominant you know, year in, in AFL history. So yeah, I, I reckon, I'd have to say 2000, mate. Yeah. But two, 93 was quite enjoyable. I still told Seeds all the time that I was because I started the year in '93 in the centre, and halfway through the year I was I was leading the BNF, and he moved me down the back line because well, in his words, he thought I might uh, <laughs> get worn out playing in the midfield as an 18 year old. But um, yeah, I still managed to finish in fourth or fifth in '93. But he threw me down the back line, which yeah, that was his choice, and I've got no qualms about it. I've got a flag, so yeah. But hey, I had a couple of good years, but obviously the flag years were, were, were standouts. How did how did you find Sheeds out of curiosity as a coach? Oh, I was the, the nutty professor. No, he was <laughs> great, mate. Yeah. Well, mate, I don't think I'd get as I don't think I'd get as many games as I did without him. He's yeah. the type of coach that threw in a deep end. He, he said, "Yeah, you're playing. I don't care." Cause he did with me when I was 17, um, and yeah, he just put you in it. He said, "I think my second game was playing Greg Williams, uh, and then my <laughs> seventh game oh, I was playing on some superstars in the middle." So he didn't care. He said, "Here, yeah, let's go have a look." And you know, if you're up to it, well, well done. But if you're not, at least it gives you some sort of uh, something to look at, and something to work on hard over, over the pre-season, and then just come back and get better. But I was happy enough to try to sort of keep keep uh, keep up with the with the guns of the of yeah. the AFL that, that year, and uh, yeah, things uh, went from there. So, is, is it true that you and the players made a deal um, in mid two thousand to not sing the club song after win, after a win until you won the grand final? Yeah, one hundred percent, mate. Got some good, you got some good mail there. Yeah. Mate? yeah, we saw <laughs> the last part of the year, and we just said because after ninety nine, we'll obviously all shattered. Yeah, um, and, and we just said, yeah, we just said, what do you sing this song every week for when it does? I know it's great to have a win and you, you know, be a player for a club you love, but you know, what's what's the importance of singing the song unless you're going to have a flag? So we said, we're not going to sing it again until and we won the flag. And I remember when we belted it out for the first time in about 10 weeks in the center of the MCG after we won the flag. It was, uh, it was pretty emotional. It was pretty, it was pretty, pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting theme song. So players back then, when you're sort of in your heyday, as far as opposition players, who did you not so much fear but respect the most? Like, just had an intense like uh, respect for as. It... Oh, I didn't fear, yeah. I, I had a few, mate. Brett Ratton and Scotty West are my two biggest. Yep. Uh, Brett Ratton was just well, well they're just similar players to me. They were just very smart. Yeah. weren't weren't quick or athletic, but could just knew how to get the ball and could tee you up in you know, ten minutes when they had seven or eight touches. But they always say Scotty West. I I, I keep telling a funny story. But all my junior footy from under tens. He played a straight when I played at Killer Park. We we played on each other from under tens right through until I retired in, in, in two thousand and four. Wow. On each other from EDFL to, to seniors. Yes, that's a we won a comp best and fairest together in under twelves, mate. So it's a bit scary. And then he coached against my son on uh, Sunday in the grand final. Oh, so we led our sides that, that often. But um, yeah, he was then uh, uh, Darren Creswell from Sydney. He was always a tough yeah. opponent. Just as you know, tough as an old boot, mate. But uh, yeah, <laughs> just those, just me. those. Just those slower, smart players that really, that's what I used to love playing on. And uh, yeah, well, I really enjoyed playing Robert Harvey a few times. He was a little bit athletic for me, but he was just a out and out superstar. And obviously, um, yeah, Greg Williams when I first started, he was mm. it was amazing how much he can get the ball. And, and then as I, as I picked on, when I see him, he's just, I could beat him in a race over 100 metres by about 80 metres, I reckon. But he was <laughs> he was just a freak at knowing how to get the ball, mate. Some of the things he used to do and some of the things he, you know, how he could react again the ball first uh, you know by a good couple of seconds was was just amazing his footy iq was you know out of this world so then just going internally um i guess the Essendon players you did play with if you sort of had a a, a sort of top three or four that you went wow this guy's seriously talented uh who, who would who were some of the names that you just struck your mind i was a few well heard he's probably the best he was just he's sort of uh, you know ability to 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 to, to win at any, any cost and yeah. Under and under duress and, and whatever have you and you gotta remember nine under nineteen when he cut the rest of them, he couldn't kick he couldn't hit the side of a barn with his kicking style. He was just no one thought or no one never knew that he was gonna be the superstar he was, but yeah, uh, just his work ethic and that's what got through. But uh, Michael Long was <laughs> unbelievable, mate. He's just a superstar, mate. And you had um, you know, Martin Curie, then you had Gavin Wanganine. So you had yeah, had a few. And that's probably a heap I missed too, mate. But you know, Fletch was Lloyd and Lucas, yeah, superstar yeah. as well. So but we just had so many good players. I think I was lucky that in my year I, I could I played with you know a lot of superstars that uh, played the Essendon Football Club. I still remember uh, even one of my great memories of Hurdy as a as a real youngster. 
Um, it might have been like his second or third year. And it was like a game at Waverley against Hawthorne. And it was kind of like, for me, a game where he sort of took over. And it was like the first time I went, oh, wow, what's coming through here? Like, it was like... Yeah. It was I like remember nothing. It was a wet game. It was, it was a yeah. wet game. Yeah, and he had the had the old traditional that. long sleeve on yeah, sort yeah. of jumper. Um, and I, th- I actually still remember McAvaney commentating that game, the Jimmy Boy. Um, it was just one of those games where I went, we've got something really, really special here. Yeah, no, he's a he's an out-and-out superstar, young James. So uh, yeah, it was good that, as I said, I started my journey with him in the 19s, mate, and played right up until I retired with him. So it was a it was a great journey to be part of with him. Yeah, yeah. So let's now, I guess, go on to Essendon today. Uh, how much do you still get a sort of around sort of with the club? I know you've got kids and everything, but uh, how much, I guess, do you still take sort of keen interest in how the, the guys are going this year? Yeah, 100%. Man. I always have since I finished playing, but as I told you, I think before off air, man, the three kids have you know, played netball, footy, basketball, all, <laughs> every sport going to man. So yep. it does get hard, but my young fellow's 40, he loves going to the footy, but. Well, she's got two girls that are nine, twin girls. That they, only this year they've really started to enjoy going to the footy as well. So, yeah. enough of better we not get them all together and we go to the footy on a so Saturday night's probably the only little night we can go. Um, yeah, but we have a, a great old time. We catch a train in and, uh, yeah, it's really, really, really good fun. And just reminisce about the days that I used to go in you know, with my dad and my uncle, which is just be just a fun time and uh, really, really enjoyable watching the, watching the boys play footy. Yeah. And, I've, and obviously with this year, it's it feels like, in some ways, the club's sort of back on its feet again. Has it been hard as an ex-player to see sort of, I guess, the things that have transpired the last four or five years? Yeah, yeah, I'm disappointed that there's been no resolution, really, has there, mate? <laughs> no, no, no yeah, that's, been, that's exactly right. Yeah. nothing, you know, I'm a bit believing to do the crime, you do your time, but who's wrong? Who's the AFL stuffed up? Is this stuffed up? No one knows. It's just, no one's put their hand up to, to accept responsibility, which is the disappointing thing, and... Then you've got all the uneducated people that want to talk footy and want to call them drug tests all the time and they haven't got an idea of what, what's going on or what they've taken or how it's been done because, to be quite frank, I don't think anyone has. So. And the AFL doesn't either, Joe. That's, that's <laughs> no, the thing, mate. They AFL. can't definitively <laughs> tell anybody what's going yeah, on, well, but apparently what they're what comfortably what satisfied. What an organisation. What an organisation. I won't go into that. But, no, um, no, yeah, yeah. It's, it's history. <laughs> but you, must, you probably must a little bit chuckle when you know guys like Dustin Fletcher and... And it might be even know Joe Watson as a kid, Bobby, back then. But to even yeah. think that they're even caught up with it, the guys of that personality, you just yeah. shake your head and go, this seriously, should, uh, this yeah. should have been the over in is, three months. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, mate, every other club in the AFL did it as well, but the only club that punished was Essendon. So that's, exactly that's a strange thing, mate. That's, that's a, I, I, I don't understand how it worked, mate. We still don't know. And hopefully one day we'll, we'll all come out. I think young James has caught the brunt of it, the poor bastard. But yeah. Um, do you still do you still catch up with him sometimes at all? Yeah, or? we tried it, mate. It's getting hard. As I said, he's had a very very difficult last couple of years, and he's probably yeah. trying to go in a different direction in his life. But um, yeah, we 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 catch up obviously with their reunions and, and what have you, and yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully, just just like one day for it all, we're going to sit down in a room and everyone come out and just tell us the truth and, and just see what what actually did happen, mate. Or one transpired. And, who was right, who was wrong, or if anyone was right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. Here, here. So um, what are you up to nowadays, Joe? What are you doing with yourself? Oh, thanks for asking, boys. <laughs> I've got a transport company, mate. Uh, I've got oh. a transport company. Uh, it's called Masiti Logistics. So like my surname, M-I-S-I-T-I Logistics, mate. So we run um, freight all around uh, Melbourne, all around Australia, mate. So anyone out there needs any transport needs, mate, or... Uh, surely you can pass my number on to anyone that uh, makes any requests. But, uh, Absolutely. On, yeah, yeah lunchtime catch-up. Website, at... Yeah, the website just from CT Logistics, so jump on there and you can find all the details on there. Anyone out there that needs something, just give me a buzz. More than happy to have a chat and help me out. Beautiful. Um, Fantastic. Is there, is there any sort of number or email? So you gave us the email address or is there anything that they can contact you on? I, all, all the numbers are on the website, mate. On so the website? Okay. So get, get on the website, mate, have a look and uh, yeah, we can go from there. Yeah, they right. can get us on uh, the lunchtime catch up at Gmail as well. Send us an email, and if you, if you want to get us, we can get it through to Joe. Yeah, too easy, mate. So, Beautiful, good boys. So, um, I guess talking about the team this year, is there? Even though I know they're sort of just just hanging on sort of the eighth mark, is there a little bit where you can see a little bit of you guys back in your early days about the fast ball movement and that? Um, I can sort of sort of see a, 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 I'll say a slight parallel. Because um, that's what we've sort of been famous for, I guess, this year is our our speed and our fast ball movement. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. When, when the boys move the ball fast, mate, I, I don't think anyone can near them. So, what they're then to do over the next uh, of this preseason and, and 
oh, let's get uh, this final series over and done with. If they fingers crossed, they do make it, which they should. But just really get some experience, and then next year they should just take. It. They just got to throw a caution to the wind every game they play. They make mistakes and make mistakes, but yeah. The only way you can learn, mate, is if you can make these mistakes and learn from them. So and that's what we did in '93. Caution to the wind. We took risks because. Let's be honest, no one expects Essendon to do anything this year, or probably not even next year either. So, but they're a very, very exciting team when they, they move the ball fast and they give it to all the little fast runners through the middle, and uh, yeah, they look like a really good side. And yep. every time they do it, other clubs can't get near them, mate. No, well, I mean, do you look at a guy like Dyson Heppel, who's not known for being overly quick, but just that sort of no knows to get in the right position? Do you sort of relate to that kind of player? 100%, mate. I always say when people say you're so slow, I say, yeah, but someone's got to get the ball out to these fast blokes on the outside. So exactly that's right. what I see. Probably a little bit tall, a little bit better than me, mate. But he was he's just a really, really good player. And he's one of those blokes that gets in there like Joe did when he was up and running. He just got the ball out to the runners because you know, these runners are there for a reason. They're outside runners that get the ball. And when they do get the ball, that no one can catch them. But as I said, mate, someone's got to get the ball out to them. Yeah, well, we used to. I mean, we've said even on, on this podcast, we've kind of tried to defend David Myers a little bit and saying, you need some of these guys. They might not be oval or overall sort of pretty yet though I think David can improve but he's just the physicality around the ball is underrated of what how much that is needed to help a, a young kid like a Parrish and McGrath and, and that around the ball just to have that sort of a senior body clashing with guys to get the ball out well 100% mate yeah. I think people don't realise unless you get really close to the action when you're watching them I don't realise how big these these mids are these days yeah. they're, they're huge mate I, when I go to Eddie, I sit about 10 rows from the front on the interchange bench and these blokes run off. They're 6'4", six, 6'5", six, you know, 95 kilos, tree trunks for legs and these massive chest. So someone's got, as you said before, someone's got to get in there and sort of battle wits with them and get in there and try and get it out to these young runners that have still got light, light body types, but they, you know, they'll build, build them out over the next couple of years and get stronger and they'll end up being the inside and outside type players that uh, you know, everyone wants in their sides. Excellent. All right, so... Um, what we'll do now is maybe just a, a quick review of the GC game. Um, there wasn't the uh, the prettiest game of football I've ever seen, but it did introduce us to my man. Um, Josh Begley? <laughs> yeah, the, the Begley or Fridge or Hodor, which now, is his they, name. Why do they call him the Fridge? My young fellas ask me that. Why do they call him the Fridge? I think because he's built. The, he's a big solid <laughs> oh, looking okay. unit. I think yeah. he's a big square solid unit, but I, I reckon... I don't think his nickname's Fridge, but I reckon all the boys are calling him Hodor from Game oh, of what? Thrones. Oh, no, see, I'm the only black in the world that's ever seen an episode. Oh, so Jay, I wouldn't know what you're talking Jay, about. Jay, you got to get on. There's a, there's a big, a big um, uh, giant-looking unit in this thing called... Ho- his name's Hodor, and all he says okay. is Hodor. And I, oh, think, okay. I think... It's one of those ones, if you that. get their nickname, it's not a compliment on how you look. No, it's kind, oh, okay. of, it's kind of not. <laughs> it means you've got a big head, basically. Yeah, it's you've okay. got a huge head. So, yeah, I mean, the, the game itself wasn't really pretty, and I think that's sort of been the way we've, we've gone this year in that we've, we've beat... Port Adelaide when maybe we shouldn't have. We've beat the big teams. We've stepped up to their level. And when we've played the Brisbane Lions of the world and that sort of stuff, we haven't really risen to that same level. Well, I think like what we discussed recently with the North Melbourne game. Um, oh, what was the other recent game where we were favourites? Um, Brisbane. Oh, Bri- no, no, where we actually won. <laughs> um, just recently. Carlton. Um, Carlton, sorry. Yep. Uh, at least the last three where we've been strong favourites, we actually have got over the line so I'm kind of hopeful that the guys are learning that mental side of the game but they smashed when you actually look at the, look at the statistics they smashed Gold Coast like they I think they were like plus 20 or 30 inside 50s yeah. uh, it was it was 11 goals 14 to 8 goals 1 you know so statistics yeah, bear, though, so I don't know, man. yeah it, it, that's right and the, that's the one thing they got to tidy up because in finals footy you can't you no, you got to not. you got to try and be 16 goals eight kind of scenario um yeah and joe in, when, when you were playing did you have any did you have any teams that i mean well I've, I've listened to sort of michael jordan's made some quotes and some of the, the the other incredible sports people around the world that when when you're in a team that you know can perform and that you know you're talented and that you know you're on the right direction sometimes you you walk onto the pitch and just expect to win like you you were there any teams back in the day and we sort of not name names or anything but were there any teams back in the day where you you knew you were going to win like you, you were really confident that you were going to win and you and you did 
Oh, not real. <laughs> Richmond, we <laughs> Richmond, uh, used to give them a touch up, and I don't know why. We always used to play well against Geelong. I can't remember how many times. Well, I lost to Geelong in my career. I don't know why we should have won over them, and obviously yeah. before they become this massive, powerful unit that they have today. But um, yeah, Richmond, Richmond, and Geelong were, were the two, and we always knew when we got those games that you know we just had good. Uh, we had a good sort of record against them, and good memories that uh, we always play well, and we always used to win. Was just on a, a, a bit of a left field question. That game against North Melbourne, the final, where we won something like by about 120 or 30, was that like, is that the most complete game you've the teams played? Oh yeah, it was. It was, mate, it was unbelievable. It was you just know, crazy play, that game. They won the play the flag the year before, so there, there were no pushovers, and it was a qualifying final. And I, you know, I think we came out. I think we won by about 21 or 20. It was only 130 points we won by. So yeah, to the final, which I think is still the biggest winning margin, it was uh, yeah, unheard of, mate. We just blew them away, mate. Blew them away. Yeah, I remember watching the game, and it was just like <laughs> literally. No clangor, <laughs> no. It was just one of those ones where I think everything just, just was strangely perfect. And Lloyd, oh, I think Lloyd kicked his hundred. And yeah, Lloyd kicked his hundred. Yeah, it's one of those games where our last two or three of the year we weren't losing top spots, so we just wanted to get to the finals without getting injuries. And we knew that lead up to the first final, the way the boys trained was unheard of, and we thought we've got three games to go before we win the flag. And we didn't even contemplate losing any of those games. We just knew what we had to do and got it done. And Mate, we were just, uh, yeah, we were savages. We just went about it and didn't know what to do and no one was getting our own. It must have been so a really good feeling. Like, you, you, even on, like, a 130-point win, you must have had a, a couple of smiles with the boys just halfway through that game. Just how good is football right at yeah. this moment? Well, it's just funny to say that. We, we, you think you'd like to do that, but you still focus. And every now and then, you, you might give a little bit of a smirk or, or muck around a little bit, but, yeah, it's, you're still trying to play your, your heart out and trying to get to the final side, mate. But, as I said, that final series, we, went north, we beat North by... 130 points, and we beat Carlton, which is probably the only side that were going to beat us again after what happened in '99. Well, then we beat them by seven or eight goals, and then you know, smashed Melbourne to the grand final by 10 or 11 goals, which probably could have been a lot more if we kicked a bit straighter. But yeah, you know, we just we we won the. I think we won the to- our total finals games. You know, I think it was by about 35 goals over th- over three weeks. So wow. it was it was pretty That's dominant. That's incredible. Final series by the boys. So, um, so just just a, a quick follow up on that one. Like you, you're saying, your boys were ruthless, and yet you look at the Geelongs in their premiership years, and they were ruthless. And Brisbane, and they were ruthless. Do you, what do you think of Joe Danaher's celebrations after goals and that sort of stuff? Playing around, I guess. I mean, if any if any players deserve to have a bit of fun, it's those boys at the moment um, coming back from what they've come back from. But is what's your argument on? Do you think whether or not they need to be more like? Vicious, more hard nosed, or is it good that they're having fun out there and that they're enjoying themselves? Yeah. Oh, I'm a big believer, man. I'm, I'm very laid back and very social sort of bloke, and I'm a big believer. You play footy because you play footy because you love it. It doesn't matter what level you play. You play at AFL, you play at local level, suburban park footy. It doesn't matter. You've got to enjoy your footy to get the best out of yourself. So if somebody wants to twirl his fingers around and have a laugh and. Let's be honest. He's probably going to be the most dominant player in the comp in the next two or three years, mate. Yeah. So, well, you can have a laugh. You, wants, yeah, you can have a laugh yeah, when you kicked over well, sixty you goals. Just, yeah. yeah, you just need to enjoy your footy. Footy is too sanitised now. It's not too serious. Everyone's, you know, it's this. We got to do this. We got this. Probably it's very, very serious, and that's half the reason why these boys can't forge a career out of it because they are too serious. You've got to remember in the end, it's just a game. It's the game we love playing, and the boys playing AFL footy at the moment. And I was one of them. We're just lucky enough that. We're a little bit talented than, than other blokes that are playing park footy and got the privilege to, to play AFL footy, but it's just a game of footy, mate. If I didn't play at Essendon, I would have probably played about 600 games at Dillard Park, so it's, just, it's a <laughs> I, game we love. I get the feeling Jamie City, too, is quite thankful um, that your career just came just before the, the social media craze. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. We, we, we frequently <laughs> talk about the old boys, mate. I, I don't get thinking my first phone, I was about 23 24, mate, so... Yeah, if the stuff said, yeah, I don't know what to think what would have happened uh, <laughs> back in the day if everyone had phones and with cameras and all sorts of stuff like that, mate, it could, could have gone a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky. Now, is there is there a famous story? I'm not I'm not sure if you're involved about um, scaring Matthew Lloyd at his house. Is it is it? Is there like a That's famous? Yeah, that was yeah, that was Solomon. That was the, that was story, man. I would have thought Dean Solomon was going to be a senior coach, but anyway. Oh, really? <laughs> I texted him quite often. Oh, he's obviously taken over the, the reins now. Yeah, sure. if you know, I don't know if you know Solly. Solly's a very he's a very laid back dude as well, and <laughs> was yep. never a massive trainer, but it was just a, the life of the party, and you know, just a ripping bloke that everyone wants to call his friend. But 
I said it when Harvey got the job at Richmond. I can't believe he was a senior coach either. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's quite funny. But yeah, it was Solomon. I think maybe the Johnson boys that did it got the the um, the mask on. What's the screen mask, the, wasn't it? The, the screen mask and. Lloyd just went and bought this big house in Mooney Ponds and thought he was the king. And yeah, I, I think he was living alone at that stage, or might have just uh, met, met Lisa and they were living together. But yeah, they got round and uh, gave him a he gave him a fair old scare in the big with that mark, mate. He, so that's um, gone. Yeah, Is it? I think was he it? Actually left a left a couple of deposits in his pants. Or <laughs> was it? Was it quite common to have sort of practical jokers back then? Was it? Because I mean, because of the lack of social media, in some ways you can get away with it, can't you? You can you can have more yeah. fun. Well, you, I mean, you could because let's be honest. Nowadays, kids don't have to leave their house to, to sort of communicate with other people. But back in the day, we had to actually leave the house to go talk to someone or do something. If you know what I mean. So yeah. we, that's what we used to do. We used to we used to grab a beer. We used to go out for tea. Or we used to go to the boys' house and you know and watch the footy show. We, we used to do things like that because you had to. We're, we're kids nowadays. You know, don't leave their house it's only to go training and to, to go to games, which is a little bit sad, mate. But that's mm. how we used to entertain ourselves. We used to play practical jokes on each other and uh, play. it just kept you upbeat because let's be honest they felt quite a serious world and you've got to train pretty hard and keep pretty dedicated to, to, to forge a career out of it and that's why I guess it's it's brilliant when supporters like us hear the stories from the inadverted commas older boys that, have, that were around before social media because it just seems like you guys had more fun off the field now probably some of it stepped over a line or two maybe but um <laughs> there, there seemed to be that that social aspect of going out with the boys mateship and, yeah, yeah mateship yeah. over at each other's well, places and stuff seems to well, be that, more than than what's happening at the moment yeah well that's how you form it i'll be blue and camaraderie in a footy club but i if you don't know your mates well enough or your teammates well enough, you're never really going to forge any sort of success. So the friendships I sort of built, you know, through the years was that's how it was that's how we that's how we did it. I mean, we went out of beer. We, we went with yeah. someone at their house, and you know, I know I talk a lot about getting get back and have a few beers, but that's just that's what that was a done thing back there. You'd have you grab a six pack and you go around to with Solly's house or you know, John O's or one of the boys and you'd have a couple of beers on a on a Wednesday night, mate. So I, I still remember in two thousand that. Every Monday night but after we did recovery, we'd all walk down to oh, O'Sullivan's, which is not there anymore, but with the coaches and the whole playing list. And they used to get, you know, plates of deep fried food. And, and the coach would let us have three or four pots on a Monday night with, with the whole list. <laughs> That's and great. Then we'd just you go never... home. And yeah. If you did that now, you know, the coach would probably try and you know, hang you up or you. You know Watson, but uh, you that's how we forged yeah. that camaraderie. That's how we that's how we developed such a strong friendship and, and such such a strong bond. So it's just so you got to socialise. You need to know each other. You know, it's pretty much inside out when you're playing AFL footy. Yeah, well, now now you would have a, a player leadership group <laughs> sort of having to suspend you for two weeks or something. To... Yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Mate? It's oh, such if bizarre, I, isn't it? If that was happening to my dad, I was going to play one game. I'd be suspended. Um, all year, I reckon, mate. So it's a little bit too sanitised to my liking, mate. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. I, I used to work for a, a mob that made spas, and um, I had the privilege of. Uh, we, I was looking at the sales orders that come through, and it was Mark Johnson. And just, yeah. I thought, I wonder if. So I, yeah. I I spoke to him on the phone, and it was Mark Johnson. I went over to his house, and I, I wasn't part of the delivery crew normally, but, mate, yeah. I was heading out to, to meet Mark Johnson, definitely. And yeah. um, that kind of thing, I mean, he, he we put the spa in his backyard, um, and then sat down with him for 15 minutes and had a beer and and discussed Essendon for a minute. And I guess I wonder whether or not that would happen today. I just wonder whether or not that it's all taken too seriously, it's all too much of a business, but... Yeah, they might sit down and talk to you, but you might get a protein shake and not a beer. Cover the difference. He was buff, that boy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Frio, this coming week. So, yeah, so... Just for Essendon fans, there's going to be 10,000 Joe Watson masks uh, available to the crowd. So I think Joe's going to be a little bit creeped out yeah, he when he slightly. sees his face everywhere 10, around the crowd. Yeah. Um, lucky, lucky he's a half good looking rooster, mate. That'd I know. Ugly, mate. That would be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Now, that's, a, that's actually a good question for you that I, I wanted to ask. Was Back in the day, who, who was the best sort of after five operator? Who was, was we, 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 hear it's, uh, we hear it's Bell Chambers now. Yeah, um, I heard Big Tommy B goes all right, mate. He yeah, goes I mean, all right. Who's who was the who was the, the the rooster in your day? Well, I think McKinney was pretty good, mate. We had a was he? Yeah, yeah. Rick Oliver, Rick Oliver, those cancer themselves, mate. So we, we did have we did have a few, mate. But um, yeah, <laughs> we won't go. We won't delve too. too <laughs> no, let's not go too much. Just, uh, just yeah, this you held your own. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> like I've got a muster. We all got a muster mate, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you had to, mate. You're, you're out every weekend, mate. So yeah, you had to, mate. You yeah, absolutely. More, more often than not, you're going to 
sort of have some sort of success, aren't you? Yeah, of course, of course. So, yeah, so Frio game, um, obviously they've announced that Green's out for the year. Um, so uh, we've still got Vantasia injured. So it'll be interesting... Um, whether Wusha goes a little bit safe and brings back a, a like a Travi Collier, a lot more experienced player, or does he take a, a bit of a, a leap of faith and do a bit of a Sheeds and bring in a kid? Because the, the VFL guys are, are pretty much starring at the moment. Mm. So yeah. you got... Might, might be a bit late, now, might be a bit late to, to bring a kid in, been the last game and not even play a final week after. But there's yeah. a kid playing consistently well the last four or five weeks. No doubt about it, I'll throw him in. But you got to try and keep your side settled and, and try and... You know, get some confidence. The best thing that could happen to the boys this week is go out against Rio and have it a good, hard win, you know, six, seven, eight goals and then get some confidence going into to the first final. And obviously, the worst is they go in there and try and save themselves for the first final, not not been there yet, and yep. get and get rolled and not make the finals at all. So, you've got to give you all I just think this is the they should be thinking this is really their first week of the final series and, and take it from there. Yeah, and and it actually comes in handy that they actually rested Collier last week and Joe Watson. So they can bring in experienced yeah. guys who have just had a week's break. Um, and Collier can play the small forward role that Green does and, and bring that kind of pressure. So I, I think that's probably the likely ins this week. Um, and just like, just for Essendon fans, um, if I've just, we did some calculations and we realized if, if we get over 22,908 fans, then we've hit yeah. the, we've hit the million mark. Of oh, Essendon fans, so yeah. that would be an amazing achievement, which I think we can get over twenty-two thousand this week. I think it'll be actually fairly packed house with the Joe Watson. Oh, you think so? Yeah, Ben. Only reason is to get one of those masks, mate. That's the only reason the kids, <laughs> the, everyone's going to turn up, mate. But uh, I, I just, they should get more than twenty thousand people, mate. So that's a <laughs> massive effort, considering you know what the club's been through the last few years. It's a huge effort. I, I just want to get one of those masks because I think my wife will, <laughs> will be much, much, more, much more happy with the end product. All right, oh, that's enough. That's enough of your personal life, that's mate. That's Speaking of the after five operation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we, we've sort of come to the end of the um, uh, of the podcast today. Um, again, an enormous thank you to uh, a bloke that we all love um, at the Essendon Footy Club, Scott and I especially. Um, I can I can say that I had your number on the back of my jumper. Um, oh, good man. You're the one, mate. You're the only yeah, one. Yeah, look, Jay, there, would have, been, there no. would have been much more than that, mate. Don't you, don't, uh, don't you worry, 24 is a big number at the SM Football Club. Absolutely. Oh, good to hear. Good we, to hear. Um, we uh, we'd like to thank you, Joe, especially for your career and for and for coming on to the um, to the lunchtime catch up podcast. We we really appreciate your your time and and uh, and talking with us tonight. So thank you very much. No worries, boys. Been a pleasure. All right, and we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll nominate episode eight is brought to you by. Uh, Mercedes Logistics. Mercedes Logistics. Give us that website <laughs> that again, Joe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds us, good to Give me. us that website again. www.mercedeslogistics.com.au for Brilliant. all your transport needs around Australia. Beautiful. I like it. <laughs> thanks very much, Joe. Thanks right, so thanks, much, boys. Joe. No worries, boys. See you later. Bye. Bye. Wow. That was, uh, that was Joe Mercedes. <laughs> who just hang up on us. <laughs> that was Joe Mercedes, mate. That was an incredible podcast with a legend of the club who couldn't possibly have been nicer. Yeah, and these these are the kind of podcasts we want to do. Um, we always, when me and Grant talked about when we do Essendon podcasts, we always had in mind a podcast for the fans and that's why we wanted the VFL one last week because we always get talk about, um, we want to hear more about the youngsters. So... Um, we hope you really like Joey. Um, we just thought it'd be really good to reminisce about some older days. And I know some, some people really cherish those kind of memories in the 93, 2000. Um, so we can't thank Joey enough. Um, what a, what a, just a, what a brilliant guy. Like, and gracious with his time. I mean, that, that was, that was nearly 50 minutes worth of just reminiscing with two blokes on a podcast. So I guess, um, we, we, we hope you hear this, Joe. Um, and we really appreciate your time. We know all the, all the listeners will really appreciate it too. One thing Scotty was just mentioned before too, is that we wanted to do this podcast for you guys. I mean, I talked, it's a lunchtime catch up. I talk with Scotty every day. We talk our, uh, our normal discussions on Essendon and every other subject, but we really want to do subjects and discuss things about, um, about the, the Essendon football club, but anything else, quite frankly, you want to talk about that interests you guys. So please send us your feedback to, um, uh, the lunchtime catch up at uh, gmail.com. You can send it through to, um, true the red sash on, um, uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, or send it through to Scotty. We really like your suggestions for um, for guests. Really uh, appreciate your questions and and shoot them through um, anytime you like. And we just want to send a, a, a big thank you to our, our fans 
um, of the of the podcast last week. It was just an enormous amount of, of it's, downloads. It's incredible. Um, that kind of, sort of gave us a little bit of a shock. That was easily our biggest podcast as far as um, listeners. Um, it was 30% above any of the, than any of the other podcasts. So obviously people like to have the, the guests and, and talk. So we just really appreciate um, all your loyal fan, uh, sort of your loyalty towards our podcast. Look, we even found out that... It's about 29 people, 29 people from the UK were even listening to our last podcast. Uh, I think there was 21 countries involved in our last podcast listing. So thank you to all the Essendon fans touring around the world. Look, in, the, in the words of James Brasher, we're flying. We're global. We're global yes. now. We're, we're flying. So, so um, yeah, we're, we're pretty humbled. Uh, and thank you so much. Um, episode nine coming next week. Um, we'll see what we can do. Something exciting for you We're guys. We're looking for weird, weird inches, inches from another big guest. We'll uh, we'll let you guys know during the week. But let's leave this note on a big thank you to Joe Watson. I don't think it's our last week, so I'm not going to go too crazy on it. Let's get this win. Let's do Frio. Let's win this comfortably. And let's play finals. This club deserves to play finals. Job deserves to play finals. Um, guys like Collier, Myers, they all deserve this. Bell Chambers, um, Hooker, um, Heppel. Um, I'm just so excited about these guys winning this week and playing finals. Um, it was mentioned um, in an article that was a bit of a token appearance, and I, I, I thoroughly disagree, even though I absolutely love the writer of the article. And it was actually a lot of good points about the article and Ron Connolly. Um, so we, we talk really well. But I, there's no way with the history we've had that this is a token finals. One, let, let's a, one we can play very, very good football. But, but two, there's a lot of guys who deserve this. So let's get a win this week. Hopefully we're in next week. We're celebrating starting our first final. We can make it a big podcast. Thanks again. And goodbye for me. And, and goodbye for me too. Thanks, guys. See ya.